So hello and welcome to the special 2023 Read Across Rhode Island episode of Downtime with the Cranston Public Library and Rhodey Radio. I'm your host, Taylor, branch librarian at the Oaklawn branch of the Cranston Public Library, and my pronouns are she, her. I'm honored to be joined today by Sarah Novich, author of True Biz, and Nancy Marjorie Heath, director of the Rhode Island School for the Deaf and honorary chair of Reading Across Rhode Island. Thank you both so much for joining me today. Thank you for having us. It's really a pleasure. I just want to make a correction. My name is McGuire Heath, Nancy McGuire Heath. I'm so sorry. <laughs> All right. Us double named people confuse the world. Thank you also to the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities and the Cranston Public Library for funding ASL interpreting and transcription for this episode. A video version of this episode will also be released on our podcast feed, and you can find a direct link to that in the show notes. Later in this episode, we will talk about True Biz and the Reading Across Rhode Island programming playing. Later this episode, we will talk about True Biz and the Reading Across Rhode Island programming planned for later this spring. But first, let's start off as we always do with what have you been reading? You want to go first, Sarah? Oh, you want me? Uh, you want to go first? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> um, other than True Biz, which I've read several times now, um, I have been reading um, some really good stuff. I've been reading um, The Personal Librarian. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that is by Heather Terrell and Victoria Christopher Murray. Uh, I highly recommend it. Um, and that is about a woman of color who had to pass uh, as a white woman in order to take a position as the personal librarian for J.P. Morgan uh, and helped him establish his um, wonderful library in New York City. Uh, and I've been reading Dinners with Ruth with by Nina Totenberg, uh, which is also fascinating about Ruth Gator Bins, uh, Bader Ginsburg. And then Dear Mr. Hamilton, which is a historical fiction. I have a weakness for historical fiction. Uh, with Laura Kay and uh, Stephanie Dray, D-R-A-Y, uh, really a really great book about Alexander Hamilton's wife, Eliza. Um, so uh, all three of those have been this past month, and I've just really enjoyed all of them. They they all sound great. Thanks for the recommendation. <laughs> um, Okay, I'm just trying to think about what I was reading. Um, I just finished a book called Invisible, Child, The Invisible Child. And the author's name is Andrea Elliott. Um, start writing the book as like a series for uh, the New York Times. Uh, it was in regards to children in poverty and not having homes, um, being without homes. And um, it eventually became a, a big book. And I think it followed that family for about 10 years, I think, approximately. Um, it's amazing. It shows like the frustrations and the, you know, the it's hard to read, but I think it's very much worth it. Um, I also just, I just finished that and also reading, um, our missing, our missing hearts. And the author is Celeste Ng. And I'm a huge fan of her work anyway. So I, uh, anytime I have an opportunity to read something else she's written, I'm going to read it. So mm. Um, I just started that, so I don't know the full story yet, but uh, so far I really enjoyed it, um, as I always do with, with her books. What have you been reading, Taylor? Um, well, I've been cramming to finish True Biz for this interview so that it's fresh in my mind, and uh, and I'm excited to talk about it a little bit later, but I was wondering while we're still talking about books, um, Sarah, especially, but Nancy, if you also have some recommendations, if people read to, if people read True Biz and are looking for some more books featuring deaf characters, if you had some recommendations of titles that you really enjoyed. 
I have a list actually that I can send you that maybe you can add to the show notes. Um, some books um, that are written by deaf authors. Um, one young author's book that I really enjoyed um, that I just recently read was called Show Me a Sign. That book is about, well, it's fiction, but it's kind of related to um, the community. It's based on Martha's Vineyard Island in, um, you know, a long time ago, there were a lot of deaf individuals that lived there generationally. And so they had their own sign language. And so the book is pretty much about that. I really enjoyed it. And um, one of my college classes, I used it uh, to teach regard, you know, using young author um, fiction writers. So yeah, I believe that's actually one of the companion picks, read across Rhode Island pick to go with your book. They wanted some, I think some younger reader uh, books. Yeah, <laughs> they wanted some books for some younger audiences to to go with True Biz being, you know, kind of like an adult. I would say True Biz has adult YA crossover in my opinion, but um, so I'm pretty sure I saw that that's one of them. That's nice. That's perfect. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, there've always been books with deaf characters, but historically, uh, the deaf characters have been portrayed um, not like the people that I know who are deaf. They've been portrayed as um, characters who deserve pity or who are lacking. Um, and it's so exciting to finally have a generation of authors who are writing about real people who are deaf or hard of hearing um, and uh, and also just including them in fictional stories. And um, not all characters are characters of privilege or characters who are hearing, but to see a diversity of characters, including deaf and hard of hearing characters included in regular books and stories, it's, um, it's great. Well, we started to see it with children's books. We started to see an enormous amount of children's books that now portray deaf and hard of hearing children in a positive light. And now, we're seeing a lot more of that in uh, adult literature, or at least a little bit more. I'm hoping it's going to be a lot more. Um, but for many years, when we would study um, deaf characters in literature with students, we were looking as far back as the Canterbury Tales. They have the deaf character, but they're not necessarily uh, people that you can identify with, you know. So uh, it's that's part of why I love this book, Troop Is, and why I really encourage people to read it um, because they're everyday people and they all, you know, they're as diverse as the community is diverse. Um, and that's um, what I love about what Sarah wrote is that she included so many different kinds of deaf and hard of hearing people and the different relationships that they have in the book. Um, and um, I just think we need more real novels like that, more real stories where deaf and hard of hearing people and their true um, struggles or their true achievements are talked about like every, everybody else. Right. Definitely. For sure. I completely agree. I remember the first time I read a book that had a deaf character and I think it was in grad school. So that entire time, you know, it took for me to actually see that. And I saw that and I recognized this deaf character and I got so excited to see that. But as I started reading the book, I was like, wow, you know, this is terrible. <laughs> you know, basically it was just terrible. Um, the character themselves was um, very lonely and isolated. And by the end of it, they killed themselves because oh. they were so depressed. So I thought, oh my God. <laughs> so it was a bad first experience for me. Um, you know, I was very excited about it. And then, you know, to see that was very disappointing. Yeah. You know, I think that was part of the motivation of writing this book as well was because of that experience. Um, if I could, Nancy, when you were talking about how kind of this like subtle representation has gotten better and better, um, 
I'm going to be very true to character and throw in one graphic novel recommendation while we're talking about books with deaf characters. So this isn't a character that uses ASL, but this is a character that visibly wears hearing aids. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I thought the book visually did very well with like the speech bubbles and then they'd have like, it's hard to explain, like just kind of like squiggles and lines when she like either had them out and people are trying to talk to her and she's not fully understanding but that wasn't like also the main part of the book the main book was about like magic and werewolves and like a really fun time but i just realized i didn't say the title it's um moon cakes and uh the author will be in the show notes because i wasn't expecting to talk about this book um but i th again that kind of like subtle representation that she's there but it's also not about that it's about you know, it's about a fantasy kind of magical realism title. So if students are looking for that or people in general are looking for that, they can see themselves in the genres that they enjoy as well as realistic fiction. Another graphic novel that many children have been reading in the last few years, particularly in Rhode Island, is El Defo, D-E-A-F-O. And uh, that particular graphic novel uh, is about a hard of hearing child. Um, and it's interesting. I was invited to dinner just the other night at a friend's house. I had never been to their home and they have several children. They have four kids and their 10 year old, um, when she asked me what I did for a living. And I said, well, I'm, I work with deaf and hard of hearing children and teenagers. And she said, have you read El Defo? And I was quite surprised. That was the first thing she brought up, but it's clear that uh, that book is being used a lot in schools around here now. So it's a it's a good, it's an open door to begin the discussion um, about um, all kinds of different hearing levels and how people live their lives, right? I think that's the other companion read. So we hit them all now. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right. Um, so before we jump into talking about True Biz, uh, what have you both been watching? Have you been watching anything interesting lately? I think, um, like everyone else <laughs> in the nation, I've been watching um, The Last of Us. That is really good. Um, there's also a deaf character. Um, I think two weeks ago, I think in the episode, they showed a deaf character within that show. Um, but I've really been enjoying that. It's funny because uh, my partner loves TV, movies, everything. But I'm more of like, if I want to watch TV and sit down and watch something, I need to do, watch something that makes me turn off my brain. So I tend to watch like, you know, the good movies with him and the good TV shows with him. But then when I'm alone, I'm, you know, I watch cooking TV, like um, Love, Bl uh, Love is Blind, all those kinds of little trash TV things. That's just garbage TV. I love it. You're definitely not alone with wanting your TV <laughs> to be something that helps you turn off your brain. <laughs> yeah if I allow myself I could be a real Netflix junkie I could just watch and watch and watch one episode of something after another um, but if I choose a, there's not a lot on regular TV anymore that I watch but I do love a series called The Resident and um, and I've been following that now this is uh, I think the fourth season maybe the fifth and um, I, I think it's the it's a great show I would go back and start from the beginning if you're going to watch it um, but I really have enjoyed um, that particular show. And I also like The Good Doctor, um, which is based on an Australian novel about a neurodiverse uh, doctor, a man with autism who is a, a doctor. And um, I have enjoyed that show as well. But if I if you had to make me choose, I would say The Resident is my my favorite I don't use oh. yeah, I don't go for medical shows usually, <laughs> but these two have really grabbed me. <laughs> the character development in the resident is particularly good. Um, so I've really enjoyed that. 
I think they can be really like stories with humans at the center, very like character driven, um, human drama kind of story. So even if you don't think of yourself as someone who's attracted to like, who's interested in the medical field in any way, um, I feel like medical shows can sometimes have a really human element that's appealing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so now I think it was like two weekends ago. Um, I watched bullet train with, uh, with my partner. Uh, if you like a fun action movie, I think Netflix described it as like Deadpool cross with knives out. Mm -hmm. Um, and it definitely has that vibe. I think the director was involved on the direction production team for Deadpool. So it definitely has that vibe of like action movie, but not like a dumb action movie, like that there's, there's wittiness, um, and it almost kind of rem reminded me of Pulp Fiction a little bit, that there's a lot of different character stories going on at the same time that are like all focused on this one thing. Also a briefcase, actually, now that I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> but we know what's in this briefcase. It's money. <laughs> All right, so I want us to have enough time to talk about True Biz. So I thought we would start out. Oops, sorry. She said, Let's do it. <laughs> I thought we would start out by Sarah, if you could talk a little bit about what True Biz is about. Sure. I don't know why I still think this is so hard, quite, such a hard question, because I, I should know by now, obviously, but <laughs> um, basically the book is about um, three deaf students. Um, the fourth character is the principal. And she's um, hearing, she's a coda. So at the beginning of the book, you were talking about these three kids who run away, run off. And then the rest of the book is trying to understand where they went and why. Also, the way that all of their lives and their experiences with the chaos and everything that's going on, how that is overlapped within each other's life. And you kind of follow that along. I think definitely it's a coming of age story. It's also a little bit a middle-aged story too um, for, you know, the principal and her experiences and with her parents becoming older and having to take care of her parents and the problems within her relationship, as well as the struggles she has at work and how that all kind of coincides at the same time. So, you know, so in the same ways, it's a growing up tale, same time. I think I can understand why you find explaining the book such a hard question, because I think the book does a lot. I think the book covers a lot, but without being overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I feel like I saw so much into deaf culture and learned so much about deaf culture more than I've ever learned in an ASL course that I've taken. So, I mean, you hit in the book on some of the major things that they'll talk about if you take an intro course, like you said about Martha's Vineyard and, and how they had this like insular community of deaf people who had their own sign language that later kind of mixed and became part of what we know to be ASL today. Um, but, and and deaf president now, I, I knew about that before reading the book. Um, but there's also just like a lot of stuff that you touch on that I 
never had heard about. And I don't think I would have heard about if I hadn't gotten this look into this deaf school and this kind of like microcosm of deaf culture. And that's really wonderful. It was really wonderful to read. I, I Well, I'm happy that you enjoyed it and you learned something. So that's great. <laughs> I was, uh, Sarah, I have to say, I, every time I read it, I've read it three times now, um, I am amazed at how you managed to touch on so many issues that I deal with every day. And you put it all between two covers. I really, um, <laughs> there are so many things you talk about the feelings of the coda. You talk about the feelings of the hearing interpreter who has a deaf child and then a hearing child. You talk about um, the, um, you know, the the February, the superintendent of the school, the principal of the school, and um, and how she is lives in both of these cultures. Um, these are things we see every day. You know, you talk about the student who arrives at school and has never been a signer is just beginning to learn how to sign and how she and her dad go to class together and how they respond so differently to the sign class as a hearing person and as a deaf person. Um, you, you talk about um, you know, those who sign and those who don't sign, but are all in the deaf community. You talk about um, how deaf, the world of the deaf is not a flat, uh, culture. It's a very rich culture, and each individual is very rich and living their full lives just like anyone else. People tend to think of our community as, oh, you, you know, they're all the same, and that can't be further from the truth. Um, and you got all of that between the covers of this book, uh, and so much more: the coming of age story, and um, and the different peer groups that um, Charlie deals with. Um, Wanda, I want to talk to you about Wanda. She's a character that I want to know so much more about. I want you to write a <laughs> sequel about Wanda. <laughs> so, um, so I just have so many things. I love her. I love Wanda. <laughs> I loved her too. And I just thought, oh, there's not enough about Wanda here. So I really, um, there are so many, so many things that I deal with every day um, in, in our community. And I just, um, I couldn't get over how you managed to touch them with such grace without overdoing it. Because sometimes you could be trying to touch on too much and it would just overdo it, you know, and it didn't at all. It <laughs> flowed. Um, I, I just think that's magic. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate you felt that way. Um, cause that was obviously a, huge concern for me. <laughs> First of all, you know, I did want to show the deaf community and uh, the way that they, you know, really are and the diversity within the community and their diversity of experiences as a deaf individual. Um, and there's all different kinds of people within the community. I wanted to make sure to show that. At the same time, I did want to be you know, kind of preaching and then lose the story. That was um, one thing I was very uh, concerned with a lot. <laughs> you successfully managed though to keep the, the thread going through all of these different stories that at the heart of being human is communication. And um, yeah, and that's the thing I, I really want parents to understand when they bring a child here at the heart of being human one-to-one -one is the ability to communicate with each other and um, and to express ourselves honestly. And you kept that thread going through the book. And I just kept going, how is she doing this? I, I'm in envy that you could write that way. I really am. I'm not trying to flatter you. I was very impressed <laughs> by it. And I attended, a book group <laughs> I attended a book group discussion. Everybody else in the room had uh, really never even met a deaf person, but that's what they came away with, that through all of those stories, um, the need for communication and access and to be able to really reach each other as human beings was so important. Um, so I, I just thought it was great. Thank you. 
All right. Well, before Sarah melts into her chair, uh, let's move on to. Um, <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Let's move on to, I know that we touched on it a little bit in our discussion about books with deaf characters, but I wanted to touch on Sarah. Why did you write True Biz? You know, what inspired you to write this book? Yeah, a little bit of that, you know, um, it's, it's an area where we wanted to see ourselves, you know, you don't really often see that ourselves in books. And if you do see a deaf character, typically need, tends to be one and they're um, isolated, they're, they're lonely. So I wanted to write a book first where there were many deaf characters and also where we would have fun because sometimes deaf Deafness or deaf stories can become a device in the story. And the deaf characters many times um, are more showing pity or showing the deaf character is, um, you know, instead of showing them doing normal things and everyday life things, they become more of a, a character you pity. So, the, you know, those were the two big motivations. And then the third one really, I would say the first part when I wrote about the characters, the character named Charlie, first started because I had read um, an article regarding um, implants, an implant company, cochlear implant company that was being sued because um, the implants were not working and they are inside people's bodies. And the company, company was aware that they had broken down and weren't working, but they still com continued to sell that model and implant um, individuals. And the thing I read, it was like just a little nothing article and you never saw anything about it again. And I, but I was stuck with that, just obsessing over it and thinking about why is this not a bigger story? It's a dangerous thing, you know, for a medical company to do something like that. So, but because, you know, our society, what we see this implant as like a magical equipment to fix that, um, fix hearing losses. I wanted to remove that picture of that, of that image. So I started thinking about how could I get the message out there um, so that more people would think about, you know, not necessarily negative or positive things, but just start thinking about it. Think about it more, you know, about implanting and, and deafness. But at the same time, Think about people who do have these broken down implants, you know, how do they feel? It's inside their body. You know, I was kind of curious about that feeling as well. And what does that look like? And how does that feel? And so with fiction, I tried to put on that character of that other person, you know, to explain that. And I really delved deep into, you know, their minds and their bodies and their feelings and you know, that's the gift of fiction, really, where we have the opportunity to really put that mask on and, and, and become those, those characters. So that was kind of where my starting place was. But I really had no other plans for the book. Um, so I didn't know what was going to happen within the storyline itself as it, until it started progressing. Um, so I was just kind of creating this one character and then it just kind of followed it to see where it would lead me. So Charlie is where everything started and then you built out these other characters from there? Yeah, Charlie's where it started, but also Elliot as well. Um, Elliot was a short story that I had written. Um, 
And then while I was writing this book, you know, I had 100 more, you know, pages worth of his story. And then I had to, you know, delete some of that out, you know, and kind of edit it down. But most of it, you know, I think I did kind of get rid of. But Charlie, I started writing and I thought, oh, why not? What if Elliot and Charlie met? So I kind of brought them in together. And then I started thinking about what other kind of deaf people would Charlie meet? And so that's when I came up with Austin, who had, you know, generation of deafness. And Austin really started a little bit as a joke, too, because I wanted to show people and have them think about, like, what happened if your family freaked out if you were born hearing? And, you know, same as, you know, the opposite is true with hearing families that freak out when they have a deaf child that's born. So I thought it was kind of funny to start to kind of play with that concept and expand that concept in his story and background. I'm also curious about what led you to include February in the CODA perspective. And for listeners who've never heard that acronym before, that stands for Children of Deaf Adults. Or listeners or viewers. Yeah, um, I think CODA is a really important part of our community. I think they have a real um, interest or draw within our community. Most deaf individuals have hearing parents. So we don't learn our language from our parents. But CODAs are very unique. They're one of the few individuals that do have that generational um, language traditions that they learn from their parents and that they pick up from their, their family. So I think it was really interesting and consequently. So um, I thought what happened, you know, if you have first language ASL and you're a hearing individual and, and you're on the border of those communities and you're having to code switch within a hearing person's world, you know, the hearing person may not feel that way, but you know, that's, that's just kind of what the character had to do. Yeah. It's the struggle of being by anything, you know what I mean? Having that prefix by in front of whatever identity that you have can really be the struggle of feeling like you're between two worlds, not not enough of either of them, you know, in, in February's case, not hearing enough, but also not deaf enough because she could hear. Yeah, exactly. And I think February walks around in the world with everyone she sees with hearing people, but inside, I think she doesn't really feel like that. She doesn't feel like she's a hearing individual. And also, I think, you know, she's trying to prove herself always because she doesn't fit in either world. I think that can be applied to, as you said, by anything. Um, my first language is not English. Um, I was raised in a family from the Azores. And so my first language was Portuguese. <clears throat> and um, as I grew up in the United States and I started to become a student and I began loving learning. Um, I started to live in two very different worlds. And there's always that sense of judgment from both sides. You know, uh, I wasn't living the immigrant experience the way my parents expected. Um, and yet I, um, you know, I didn't ever feel feel like I measured up to those well-educated, uh, many uh, parent students with parents who'd gone to college, those kinds of things. And so um, there is that tension and that judgment uh, or that you think it's a judgment. It may not be, but that's what it feels like inside of you. 
Um, and many times I had to ask myself, which world am I really inside me? Which world am I really living in? I felt that way with February. And I think her attraction to Wanda has a lot to do with the fact that inside um, she doesn't necessarily feel like a hearing person. Um, and she felt so comfortable with Wanda, who is a deaf person. Um, and maybe that's why I was so drawn to Wanda, because I thought, yeah, that's the key to February's heart right there, you know. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. Yes. Um, so I also wanted to talk a little bit. I heard you in another interview talk about how difficult it was to put ASL on the page. So I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that process and how you ultimately came up with how it's structured in the book. Yeah, that was um, one of the biggest challenges for me with writing the book. I mean, ASL is so rich. And, um, you know, you're changing from 3D and putting it down in a 2D format. You lose a lot. So I was trying to think, like, I know, like, I'm going to lose some of that. But how can I show it? You know, especially for hearing people to show the deaf characters within the book that ASL is not broken English. It's really clearer and um, better language for them than English can be. So I did a lot of bad experiments. <laughs> and the first thing that I did try to do was um, use what we call gloss. Um, it means that basically you're writing down as a, a straight translation in English on paper, but within the ASL word order. So I tried that first, but then I knew hearing people who read that would be like, okay, see broken English. So, nope, threw that experiment out. Um, then I think the second thing I tried, for a while, there was something related like colors. And then I had tried um, something where I wrote the words on the page related to where we, like where our bodies would be in relation to each other. So that's kind of where, that was the worst one. That was, it just had the language everywhere on there. So I was like, that was, that did not work out. It looked really bad. And finally, I realized, okay, using the space on the paper to show the reader, like who is speaking. Because in ASL, if um, I'm sitting here having a conversation, I set up things spatially for, you know, you know, when I'm talking about different characters. So if, if I'm going to talk about this over here and I'm going to talk about you over here, um, I'll remember who that is later if once I've set them up, where, you know, what place they're going to be. So I kind of played a little bit with that dialogue in the book as well of where I set up the dialogue. So we can have the spatial use of ASL and then it's on the page that way set up um, so that you know where people are speaking from and what place, where they're standing. And then conversely with that, when people are speaking in English, I decided to write it without quotation marks. That made very, a lot of people very angry. <laughs> And I get it, but that was the point. <laughs> okay, because I was going to ask you, that was going to be my follow-up question was, because uh, I have a theory of why you did it. 
but I want to see if I'm right of of what why you chose to admit quotation marks for uh, speaking characters when people were using their voice. Yeah, I wanted um, hearing people to have a little bit of an experience of what you have to do and how hard the work is for deaf people to pay attention to who's talking, what are they saying and trying to lip read. And that was just really one little tiny part, but I think, I'm hoping that if you look at dialogue, that dialogue and compare it to with the ASL dialogue, you can see, wow, look at the space and how it's being used. It's so much more clearer when someone, an individual is using sign as opposed to um, just this lines of, of English. That how we have to do, then that forces the hearing individuals to do more work. Okay, that's what I suspected. The English major in me is happy that I like interpreted that your intention um, correctly, <laughs> but also funny related to that before we really got into a lot of sign in the book. At first I thought Mel was deaf. I was like, oh, she's a coda. And then she met someone who was deaf, like through the deaf community and they're signing this whole time. And then I saw how sign was set up on the page as we got into the book a little bit more. And I was like, oh, I've been reading this whole thing wrong. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> it, it was like a quarter of a way into the book. So it went, we, I was able to course correct in my brain uh, pretty quickly, but still I was like, oh. You had to go back, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, oh, it's all making sense now. <laughs> All right. Um, before we talk to Nancy a little bit about the Reading Cross Rhode Island program, uh, is there anything else, Sarah, that you want people to know about True Biz? I think for me, one thing that's wonderful about the reading program that Rhode Island has is that many individuals are able to, you know, see the book and get out there that maybe that they wouldn't normally see it. So I do want to encourage people who know the story in the book. Yes, they are deaf, but the story itself is universal. It's really about trying to find your place in the world. And everyone, I think, can understand that and empathize with that. Yeah. So <laughs> don't be scared. So Nancy, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, maybe for people who don't understand what it means uh, that you were named the honorary chair of Read Across Rhode Island. And so I was kind of curious what that has entailed with you and what your role within Read Across Rhode Island has been this year now that you were named the honorary chair and they picked True Biz as their book. Well, I had read the book um, when it first came out and I was really excited and I didn't know what to do with my excitement. I just saw so many possibilities in the book. Uh, and then um, my, I, I got a phone call saying, would you like to be an honorary chair? And I said, no, I think that um, I would be willing to co-chair, but I think the chair should be a deaf person. Um, and so then they said, well, do you know um, anyone else who has read it or who would want to be a chair in the deaf community? And I could think of several people, but um, I thought about the chairman of our board of trustees, Amanda Montgomery, um, and she herself um, has had a very interesting journey and different educational experiences. She's an, an attorney and, um, and she's been a wonderful chair to the board, uh, encouraging our school uh, in the 11 years that I've been here. And when um, they asked her, she was very excited and it, it was just such an honor to co-chair with her particularly. Uh, so that's how it started. Um, and then from there, uh, it was really interesting how it mushroomed. I attended a book group in Lincoln at the library, and it was about a different book altogether. 
Uh, actually, it was about the personal librarian that I mentioned earlier. And while we were there, the woman who facilitates that discussion said, oh, and our next book um, is going to be True Biz. And I almost jumped out of my chair. I couldn't get over it. Um, that there were already people reading this even before it was um, they knew it was Read Across Rhode Island. So once um, Read Across Rhode Island started publicizing the book and we started having our students uh, read it, um, then we just got lots of calls and conversation and um, and discussions in the teacher's lounge about the book. And um, one of the uh, senior, two of the seniors who are reading it asked me to come to their classroom because they wanted me to hear their discussion about the book. So that was very exciting. And it's just been growing and growing as I know more book groups are reading it. Um, I know one of our teachers here who is the president of our teachers union is going to be leading a discussion at the state union at Neary uh, with um a representative from the union there. And so you can see all different places are beginning to look at this book. And I I just can't think of a better thing to do. You know, I think for having all of these people get introduced to a culture that they may think they know, but they don't, or they've never been exposed to before. What a wonderful way for our state to um, increase its awareness about the deaf community. And uh, we're a small state. Um, but I can't, um, I think many states could replicate what we're doing. I really do. Is that what you were looking for? Yeah, no, that was great. Um, and how was, so you've been using it at the Rhode Island School for the Deaf mm -hmm. as an educational tool. How has your student body reacted to the book? Um, it's been really exciting actually to hear the things that they focus on. You know, they're young people and what I thought they might focus on has turned out to be a little different than what they have focused on. That just tells you how old I am. Um, and a little out of touch with what they, um, they were very um, interested in the, I don't wanna blow the story for anyone who hasn't read it yet, um, uh, but they were very interested in some of the action that takes place, particularly toward the end. Um, and uh, the student, you know, the students are, somewhat involved in this and they wanted to talk about that. They were very focused on that whole thing. Why did this happen? And why why is this the way it ends? And um, so that was really interesting. Um, and then to get them to reflect on the many different deaf and hard of hearing characters in the book was such a joy for me because they don't always stop to think about how diverse their own community is. And so it was wonderful to have them stop and, and reflect about that. Um, and what is it that ties them all together, even as diverse as they are? And so that was great. And then one of our teachers, um, we have a group of students who came to language very late um, and they really have had experienced language deprivation or language insufficiency. And so their reading level, the book is written at too high a level for them. And so what this teacher did was she took it chapter by chapter and she created readable summaries of each chapter with direct quotes from each chapter in her summaries. And so this group of students who um, could not have accessed the book otherwise, they have also read the book, but they've read it through these um, summaries. And that group was so excited to read a book about themselves. There are nine of them in that group. And they just couldn't get over that, you know, this book was by a deaf author written about deaf people. And I loved their discussions. I just really did. They don't always get to access um, terrific books that we all love. And many of the books that are written at a high interest, low readability level, they lose their I don't know, they just lose some of the richness of the language. And these chapters that the teacher um, summarized, she tried to maintain the richness of the language that Sarah used. So uh, I was really excited for our kids to uh, have access to it. That really makes me happy. <laughs> it's funny too, because um, I had conversations with um, a School for the Deaf in Colorado and it was um, virtual with them. And it was funny to see the same thing really um, 
what really interests them and what they really got involved with. And they loved the triangle. They were obsessed with that. Which will Charlie pick? Which, which boy, you know, that kind of thing. And they want to fight each other over it. And it's like, oh my gosh, it was really, really amazing. It was funny to see, you know, really what people, I was happy to see that they had like a book where they could, you know, see the deaf characters in love and mm-hmm. in and in a love triangle so mm-hmm. and to have that in-depth discussion and kind of debate with each other it was awesome it was very cute yeah yeah it's been great to see the students reaction uh, I learned so much from watching them uh, discuss the book it was great this uh, one group is just finishing it now. They have, I think, another week to go. So I'm going to go in on the last day and uh, have them sort of summarize things for me. It'll be great. So we've had three different groups of students reading it. And Nancy, is there anything else you'd like to say about reading across Rhode Island before we wrap up? Just what a gem it is. Um, and I think people don't realize what they have in this. Um, last year's book was terrific. This year's book, of course, I'm very biased. Um, and this is the last year of my career. I'm retiring this year. And I I felt like this was a personal gift to me, that the state would look at this book in my final year after 47 years in my profession. Um, so what a way to go out, to be able to discuss Um, the deaf community that I love and the deaf characters in this book that portray such a richness of life. Uh, It's just, it it felt so personal. I know, Sarah, you don't even know me, but it felt very personal. So it's been great. It's been really fun. (laughs) That's awesome. And congratulations on your retirement. (laughs) Thank you. All right. So we wrap up the show with the segment I call The Last Chapter, where we talk about a library or bookish related question. And I thought I would ask you both uh, what would be, or you can pick like one person as who you would cast in like a dream cast of a book of your favorite book. Like if it were to be a TV or a movie, a TV, a TV <laughs> show or a movie. Uh, <laughs> I know it's a hard one Hmm. or maybe one of the books you talked about today if it's too hard to think about like oh pick a favorite book first before I even pick a person yeah I can't (laughs) pick a favorite book (laughs) my brain just shut down real quick so (laughs) yeah I don't know that's a very hard question I'd have to give that some thought hmm Okay, hold on. I'm going to switch it. We're going to do last minute, last minute change. We'll rework our question. (laughs) Uh, We'll pick a character from True Biz. And if True Biz was to become a TV or movie, who would you want to play that character? Have you given some thought to this? Okay, that's much easier. Yeah. (laughs) Have you given some thought to if, uh, if True Biz were to ever get adapted, like who you would want to be involved? Yeah, right now, um, we are in the beginning stages, very, 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 very beginning stages of trying to um, pitch and develop something for TV. But one of the individuals that I'm working with um, is Millie. Simonson? Simons, it's S-I-M-M-I-N-D-S. Um, she's in the movie Quiet Place, the little girl who plays in the Quiet Place. And I think she would be perfect for Charlie. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Mm. So I'm a big, she's a big supporter of the book. And, um, and she said uh, she saw a lot of herself within the story because she herself was implanted um, and she's an, a CI user and the family is really strongly opinionated about um, if she should be allowed to sign or not. So seeing that experience, she, you know, she saw that experience in that book and she could really identify and, and 
uh, with the character. And in general, um, she's an amazing actress too. So, <laughs> so if, if hopefully it does get made, you know, and I think she would be perfect for Charlie. I feel like we're like revealing so like breaking news here on downtime. So hopefully we're not breaking any of your NDAs. <laughs> no, 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 no secrets. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time things, you know, never um, happen. So yeah, it would be fun though. <laughs> Nancy, is there anyone you would want to see in a true biz adaptation? Yeah, and I can't really uh, say I. I don't say this just because it it feels politically correct, but I would like to see as many deaf actors or actresses in the show as possible. It would be really wonderful to um, have them portray real deaf people. You know, I mean, have real deaf people portray these deaf characters. Um, that would be really terrific. Um, but we'll keep Definitely. our fingers crossed. We'll keep our fingers crossed <laughs> that it happens. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Same. <laughs> All right. How exciting. Oh, and Sarah, so where can people find you online if they want to learn more about True Biz and your other books and any of your upcoming projects? Yeah, sure. I have a website, obviously. It's just my name, dot com sarahnovich.com um that's a good place to find information on events and that kind of thing um, if you want to see me yell on the internet you can find my twitter <laughs> and that's novich sarah so it's my name flipped um, i'm also on instagram as well and that's Photo Novich. All right. Fantastic. I think that's it. And I will be in Rhode Island actually in April. Right. Yes. So uh, we will have information about that event in the show notes, but yes, you'll be in person in an event next month. Um, so like I said, check out the show notes at uh, uh, ribook.org slash rari, uh, R-A-R-I. Um, find out more information about that. Um, and thank you both for joining me. And I want to thank everyone who's listening or watching. Like I said, for more information about reading across Rhode Island and their upcoming events in celebration of this year's selection, True Biz, visit ribook.org slash R-A-R-I. There are also resources you can find there if you want to discuss true biz with your book club or use it as a teaching tool um, and if you'd like to share this episode on social media or with a friend we'd really appreciate it we want to get word out uh, not only about our respective podcasts but also about the reading rhode island program and of course true biz um, so again thank you both so much for joining us and this has been another episode of downtime and roadie radio thank you taylor thank you thank you thank you so much <laughs>